on YouTube uh, after this. So I think, you know, people, people can always go back and look at it. So, well, uh, I have the pleasure of actually introducing Corey. Um, and, and I don't know how many people remember, but he came uh, last year talking about parrots, in fact. And I've actually met him in the field. And, you know, we had some discussions about, you know, in general things. But one thing, um, and thanks for reminding me, actually, uh, you are a retired neurosurgeon. Uh, with a lot of interest in photography recently, in fact, uh, as late as what 2016, you said you did not even have a camera before that. That's uh, and to see, and to see the photographs that you know he has shown before, and I think the collection is going to show today, uh, and the fact that uh, you have been on the Audubon foot, the the photography, um, uh, what do you call the competition? You're the, in the top 24 for the last two years, so. Uh, this is just absolutely stunning. And the pictures you have shown before, I follow you on Instagram. I, I think it's just absolutely fascinating. But this year you had a different angle. You wanted to show something different. So, Corey, uh, please take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Sri. So when, when Sri and I were talking about my coming and giving a talk, he wondered if I might be interested in talking about some of the local pictures that I've gotten. And so I've called this talk Lockdown shooting local photos during the COVID years. And that that's sort of what I'm going to concentrate on here. Whoops. Why won't it let me have to, it won't let me advance. There it goes. So just a bit of information to start. Uh, all the photos that I'm going to show you are of animals in the wild. Um, the, yeah, there are no trained animals or pet animals. I try hard not to have any man-made objects in my photos. I do make an exception for fence posts, but the fence posts has to be a wooden fence post. And I really prefer if it's a weathered wooden fence post. I think I have a couple pictures with fence posts in them here. Um, because of my training as a neurosurgeon, precision matters a lot to me. So I really try hard to get very sharp photos. The, the gear that I'm using is Nikon gear. Um, many of the pictures were taken with a Nikon D850 and with a, a 600 millimeter uh, f4 lens. The shots that I'll show you that were taken from my balcony were taken with the 500 millimeter uh, f5.6 pf lens. I do have a zoom lens that I use occasionally, and I did get, finally, uh, a, a Z9 camera body. So some of the last pictures were taken with that. My very favorite thing to shoot is parrots. That's what I talked about last time. And uh, remarkably, I have some parrots to show you in this talk. So when Sri and I were talking, I was talking about how I had set, put a setup on my balcony so I could shoot pictures of birds. And here's a picture of the setup on my balcony. We just put up a bird feeder at one end of the balcony and attached perches that we could, you know, we just take them off and put a new one on, take it off, put a new one on, um, on the railing to the balcony. So the birds would come in and stage on the perch before they jumped up to the feeder. And I just sat at the other end of the balcony and waited to see who came by. Um, as expected, mostly what came by were very common birds. Um, so I'll have a lot of very common bird pictures and, and obviously these are bird on a, on a perch pictures. I thought I'd start with a house sparrow. Um, sparrows, yeah, sparrows aren't my favorite birds, but the house sparrow is, is probably the most numerous bird species in the world and probably the most widespread bird species in the world. It uh, was native to uh, Europe around, around the Mediterranean basin uh, into Africa and then into Asia, um, but they've just been transplanted everywhere and they are very happy to go any place and do very fine. Right now, the population is estimated to be 1.4 billion birds, which is just mind boggling. And this is a male and just, you know, despite being a sparrow, it's not completely unattractive. Um, this is a chestnut back chickadee, which is our local uh, chickadee species. Um, they live on the Pacific coast, sort of down into Southern California, but go north all the way into Alaska. Here, they're, it's the only chickadee that we have in this area, but as you go north, then they overlap with other chickadees um, that are listed here. Um, it's a very easy species to identify because the, it's the only chickadee with this chestnut colored back from, from which obviously they get their name. And then uh, here are a few more pictures of, uh, of chestnut back chickadees on different perches. 
I try hard to get their backs in the picture because that's uh, how, what makes it so easy to identify them. One more, um, you'll notice that I really like Catani aster branches with berries on them. You'll see a number of different ones. And here, here's the chickadee. I really like the red berries. And this is a dark-eyed junco, another one of our common birds. They're members of the, of the sparrow family. Um, there are many subspecies, like most species with many subspecies, it's argued how many there really are, um, but, but, it, but probably 15 or so. And they really vary a lot across their range. Um, you know, I've seen people show pictures of these birds and they're all gray. You know, it's just a gray bird, which is just remarkable when ours has this, the, the males here have this black head with the brown back and they're kind of, kind of attractive. Um, they're here, as I said, they're here year round. And this is another sparrow species. It's a fox, it's a fox sparrow. These birds were named fox sparrows because one of the subspecies is kind of reddish like a fox. But uh, the subspecies that lives here is called the sooty subspecies. And they're not red, they're brown. Um, they overwinter here, so you'll see them in the winter, but uh, they breed up the coast farther north from here. Another sparrow. Um, this is the the gold crown sparrow. This is a large, a pretty large sparrow. It's, it seems bigger than most. It's bigger than any of the birds I've shown you so far. And their characteristic feature is that little uh, orangey uh, crown that they have, that kind of comes and goes through breeding season. Um, but again, they overwinter here, so they're only here in the winter. I really like house finches um, because they're, they're just, the males are so pretty when they're in breeding plumage and they have just this most beautiful song. Um, when the first time I heard one sing, I was looking around to see what bird it was and I saw a finch and I said, oh, that can't be what's making that song because it's just so beautiful. Um, the males develop this red coloration in the breeding season. It kind of ranges from red to orange. And interestingly, someone did a study and it looks like the females really like bright red more than dull red and red more than orange when they're uh, selecting their mates. Another picture of a house sparrow showing those beautiful red colors. <clears throat> and this is a lesser goldfinch. It's one of the three goldfinch species that we have in North America. They're the smallest one. And in fact, um, they may even be the smallest finch of all. They're, they're very small. The males have the black cap and the yellow chest. The females are duller in color. What's interesting about these birds is that they vary across their range, um, but it just kind of shades as you go. So it's not like they're subspecies. And the farther that you go, um, south and east, the more black they have running down their neck onto their back. And the birds way at the other end of their range are all black. Their whole, their whole back is black. But because we're on the west end, we have uh, birds that have olive backs. Um, I think the black back actually is a little more attractive, but that's the way it is. Another lesser goldfinch male. And here's a turtle dove. This is the world's most, the most common dove. Um, you know, you say, just because I'm sitting out on the balcony doesn't mean it doesn't rain. Um, but, it, but we have an overhang, so I can sit in the rain, but the birds don't get to sit in the, out of, uh, excuse me, I can sit out of the rain, but the birds don't get to sit out of the rain. So you can see he's got some water droplets on his head because it was raining. These birds are called morning doves because they're supposed to have a mournful cooing sound. Although I have to say, when I was a boy, I used to hear these birds cooing and, and I thought they were owls, and I keep looking around for an owl, not realizing that it was a dove that was making the, making the noise. Um, these birds, you're allowed to hunt these birds in the United States, and up to 20 million of these birds are killed every year for sport. I think some people eat them, but, but mostly for sport. I, it's one of those things I don't understand very well. You can walk around, and they'll be all around your feet, and you're going to pull out a gun and shoot them. It seems kind of silly. Um, but the birds are just breed like crazy. Uh, they can have as many as six nests a year. So they have a, a stable population of, of, of around 475 million. So the shooting doesn't seem to be hurting the population. And here's a portrait um, 
uh, the birds do allow pretty close approach. And then again, I'm shooting with a 500 millimeter lens when I'm sitting on the balcony. <clears throat> this is a pine siskin. I don't know how, uh, how many of you remember that we had a real eruption of pine siskins last year. Um, and I had initially thought that the, that it was just a bunch of house sparrows that were come, excuse me, a house finches that were coming to our feeder. But then I noticed some of them had a little yellow shading on them. And when I put a picture up on uh, Merlin, they said it was a pine siskin. So I didn't even realize I was looking at them, but now at least I know, I sort of know how to recognize them, but there were so many of them in, in this big eruption really all around the country that they were, they were huge numbers of them. And, uh, and they were coming into feeders, and because of the close contact, there began to be a salmonella epidemic amongst the birds at bird feeders. So we took our feeder down, we cleaned the feeder, we left it down for a month, and then until the pine siskins were gone, and then uh, put it back up. And this is a purple finch, looks a little bit like a house finch, but you can see the shading is a little bit different. It's more pinky purple than, than the red. Uh, or orange, and they have a little bit more color going down the back of their head and onto their bellies than the than the house finches do. Um, <clears throat> this bird uh, is, is not endangered, but the population is definitely falling. And part of the problem is that they are native to the east of North America, and now we've introduced house finches there, and they don't compete very well with the house finches. There's a, another picture of a purple finch, this one uh, in in the rain. So this is a picture of a California scrub jay. This is this is our blue jay. People call them blue jays, but of course they're not. They're scrub jays. Um, and uh, they there used to be one species of scrub jay across the United States, but it's been divided up into four um, species. We have the California scrub jay here. Um, they are kind of bullies, you know, when they come into the feeder, all the other birds are, get chased away and don't come back until the scrub jays leave. But fortunately, they don't stay for very, for very long. They are pretty big of the birds I've shown you, and it was a little bit hard to fit them in with my 500 millimeter lens, but it did give me the opportunity to get uh, a good uh, portrait, as you can see here. Um, pretty, pretty birds, but kind of a little bit obnoxious, I guess. Um, and this is a song sparrow. I think this is the last sparrow that I have. So, song sparrows um, are supposed to have these great songs, but I don't think that their song is, uh, songs are all that great. They sing pretty short songs, but they do know lots of songs. A uh, male will often just pick one and repeat it over and over and over again, this short call of five or six notes before, before he switches uh, to another song. And this is the warbler that comes to our balcony, uh, Townsend's warbler. Um, I was sort of surprised to see it because these are birds of uh, evergreen forests along the uh, coast of, uh, along the west coast of North America. But uh, these birds have come for three year, uh, three years now. I don't think it's the same bird, but I've only seen one at a time. And they all have non, they're either females or in non-breeding plumage when they come here. Um, but they don't, they overwinter here and farther south, but they go north north to breed. And here's a couple more pictures again, one in the rain. I know everyone's surprised I keep showing these pictures in the rain, but that's just because when it rains, I go take pictures. And if it only rained three days last winter, well, that's the way it goes. Okay, so though that's pictures of the birds that I get on my balcony, and I thought that I'd now expand out and show some of the other places that I went that were close by, that I didn't feel bad traveling to um, uh, in the Bay Area. And the first is Golden Gate Park. Uh, my wife, Kathy, and I live near Golden Gate Golden Gate Park, and it's a good place for photography. The Botanical Garden is especially good, but there are other places where you can find um, birds in the park. There's a picture of Anna's hummingbird um, taken in the Botanical Garden. Uh, you can see it's got pollen on its beak because it's been feeding on salvia plants. There are a lot of salvia in the Botanical Garden, and they really like them. 
Um, the males are really beautiful because they're essentially their whole head, their crown, their gorget, and their ear coverts are this iridescent uh, pinky red. And it really, one of the things that I learned about Anna's hummingbirds when I started taking pictures of them is that the color that you see changes depending upon the angle of the incident light and reflected light that you're looking at. And, and there are some pictures I have where the gorget is purple. It's not red at all. Um, so that's just an interesting uh, 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 optical property of the iridescence of these hummingbirds. Uh, and this is a, <laughs> I, I can't call it a little brown bird because it's not that small, but it's sure is a drab brown bird, but it's very common, the California towhee. They do like to stay in the bushes. They don't like to come out very much. So it's hard to, 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 uh, uh, to get good pictures of them, but there's so many of them that often you can get a picture. And this one just popped up out of the brush at, in, in the botanical garden. I was able to snatch it, snap its picture. In the botanical garden, there is a cactus garden. And in the cactus garden, there are a number of agave plants. And the agave plants have been there long enough that every year, one or two of them send up their big flower spike. And the flower spikes, the, the, as you know, the agave plant then dies and the flower spike blooms and, uh, and then it dies, but they stay there standing up for some time. And the woodpeckers like to come and make holes in these stem, the stem of the agave and nest in the stems. Um, the, uh, this is a Townsend's woodpecker that's nesting in it. I went back this year to see if I could find the Townsend's woodpeckers again. And I took some pictures and I just said, oh, look, the Townsend's are back. When I got home and looked at the pictures, they weren't Townsend's, they were Nuttles woodpeckers. So Nuttles woodpeckers had just taken over the same hole that the town that the downy woodpeckers had been using the, the year before. <clears throat> As I'm sure most of you know, in uh, the islands in uh, the little lake in Golden Pike Gig Park called Stowe Lake, that's the lake where you can rent the paddle boats and paddle around, um, there is a great blue heron rookery. And you can uh, go there and get pictures of the herons in the spring flying back and forth to to, re to rebuild their nests. Um, I really like going there because I like, it's one of the few times I like getting sk white sky background pictures because I think it reminds me of a Japanese woodblock print every time I look at the pictures of these birds as they fly through the sky. I haven't, I didn't go I didn't go there this year because there were some reports that people were being held up and having their camera gear stolen. And so I was a little bit nervous about that. So I just didn't go. And I think that this is, this is a hermit thrush. This is also in the botanical garden at Golden Gate Park. Um, I have a lot of trouble trying to decide how to tell the difference between a hermit thrush and a Swainson's thrush. They're both in theory found here. Um, so if anybody says, Corey, you're nuts, that's a Swainson's thrush. I'd appreciate you dropping me a note and letting me know. But I think it's a, think, I hope it's a hermit's thrush. I have a very nice uh, song. If you go to the botanical garden, there are some, there is a redwood grove there. So the birds that like to be in the conifers can hang out there. And one of those birds is the Pacific wren. I really like the Pacific Wren because you could go to the botanical garden and the first time you hear one, it's sort of like, oh, spring is coming because the Pacific Wren is here. Um, so I call, I always call the, the their their song the, the the sound of spring in Golden Gate Park, but there weren't any. I didn't hear any this year, so I hope that that's just a funny thing and that they'll be back again next next spring. They just have a really beautiful song, and uh, it's so fun to hear them. This one you can see is singing his heart out. In the in the botanical garden, there's also a pair of red-shouldered hawks that uh, have a that have a nest. Um, so if you watch for them, you can see them. Um, this is the second most common uh, budio in the in the Bay Area. Um, they're called red shoulder hawks because really their shoulders are red, but you can't see the red unless they're open their wings. It's really easy to see when they're flying, but you almost never see it when they're perched. And, and this is an immature red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks are by far the most common uh, hawk 
species in the Bay Area. Um, I've heard estimates that that it, that has meant as much as 85 percent of the uh, uh, hawks in the in the Bay Area are red-tailed hawks. This is a juvenile who just left the nest recently, and he's flying off screaming loudly because he's got a little uh, rodent in his in his talon. So he's hoping that maybe that's a sign of good things to come and that he'll be able to hunt well. Um, in the park, there is a buffalo paddock. It's really a bison paddock, and it's filled with uh, female bison. Um, and the uh, Park Service has put a bunch of bluebird nests around the edges of the buffalo paddock inside the fence, not outside, but inside the fence. But there's a place you can go where you can stand on the bench that people sit to watch the bison. And if you set your tripod up on the high, as high as it'll go, you can look over the fence while you're standing on the bench and you can get pictures of uh, bluebirds as they're coming into their uh, nest to uh, feed their young. So here's a picture of a bluebird, and I'm just—I was just amazed at how many insects they could fit in their be in their beak at once. The real problem for me there was that they're little birds and they fly pretty fast, so you have to have a really fast shutter speed um, in order to capture them in a meaningful way, and uh, and it's foggy <laughs> in Golden Gate Park, so there's not often not a lot of light. Um, so I'm always shooting wide, I'm shooting wide open when I take these pictures and I'll, and you're not that far away, uh, uh, from the nest, probably less than 20 feet. So my depth of field is just so narrow that I, I don't know how many pictures of these I shot, uh, over, I don't know, somewhere between 18 and 24 hours of just photographing bluebirds. And I probably came away with 10 sharp pictures, but I like, I like the sharp pictures that I got just was a challenging location. And here's a couple more of the female on the left coming in uh, to the nest again with a number of insects in, in her beak. And uh, you can tell the nest box all covered with uh, lichen because it's so wet there. And then the back view, I don't, I keep very few pictures of birds that aren't flying at least somewhat towards me. But I just really love this one, the, uh, the composition, the angle of the bird and the bright blue color. Another place that I went to regu regularly the last two years is Point Reyes National Seashore. It's about a 90-minute drive from San Francisco, so you can figure out how long it will take you from where you live. I really think it's it, it's just a magical place. It's, it's hard to believe there's a place like this in the Bay Area, and I highly recommend you go if you haven't been or go again if you have been. There is a problem there, however. The United States National Park Service is current, currently has a new plan that they want to put in place uh, for this national park. And the plan includes allowing the farmers who have been leasing land on the park since the establishment of the park in the 1960s to uh, have 25-year leases instead of five-year leases um, to increase the livestock that they have to uh, include uh, pigs, goats, and sheep instead of just cattle, uh, to increase the number of cattle they're keeping, and to cull the Thule elk herd because they're competing with the cattle for food. They also say that they want to plant row, row crops. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the articles recently in the newspaper about the water in Point Reyes, but the coliform bacteria count in the water entering the ocean from Point Reyes is is the is in the top ten polluted streams in the United States because of all the cattle that are there. And it's a little bit hard for me to believe that there are ten times more cattle than elk, and they're worried about the elk com competing with the cattle. But anyway, I can talk about it for a long time, but they're being sued right now, and we'll just have to hope that that. Uh, that they're forced to see reason. Well, I'm going to show you a lot of bird photographs at Point Reyes. I have photographed many other animals there, tule, oak, uh, tule elk, northern river otters, elephant seals, long-tailed weasers, badgers, mule deer, coyotes, and bobcats at least. I've seen and almost run over a, a gray fox, but, uh, but I haven't got a photograph of it, and I keep looking for them when I go. So this is a picture of a female American kestrel. Um, there is a, a, a path um, at Pierce Point that, that goes out to a lighthouse, and, uh, and it goes right along the edge of the ocean. So the wind comes in off the ocean. There's good uplift there. And in the winter, as the raptors migrate, um, 
or, or hang out there. They can hover in the wind and hunt. And this female is just watching for uh, insects from her perch right on the edge of the ocean. And this is a burrowing owl, um, also at Point Reyes. This one sort of surprised us uh, being just beside, we were just driving down a road and it was just standing there in this hole by the side of the road. I think it recognized that it made a mistake because it didn't stay there very long, but I was able to get some pictures of it. I think what's really interesting about the, bur the burrowing owls in the Bay Area is that there, there are two distinct populations. There is a resident population that stays here year round. And there is a migratory population that comes here for the winter and then migrates up uh, uh, to the sort of to the Oregon, California border and breeds up there. And in the winter, the populations don't mix. One stays down in the flats and one stays up in the hills. And but by DNA testing, the populations don't mix. Their, their DNA is distinct from each population and they don't mix. So they're completely separate. They look exactly the same. Um, but uh, but here we, here we are. The ones that I've seen in Point Reyes have all been migratory. And here's a California quail, certainly a, a stunning bird. It's our state bird. They are found uh, throughout uh, California, into Baja, California, North Oregon and Washington, even go east as far as Utah in a scattered way. They uh, live in these big groups called coveys, as you know, and uh, the male often is a, watches out. He stands up, sits up on a perch like this while everyone else is on the ground foraging. And if you get too close, he peeps a little bit and everybody flies away. Um, the thing that's so funny about the quail is it looks like they have this one feather that's sticking up out of their head to make that little top knot, but actually it's made out of six feathers, which I thought was sort of remarkable. Oh, see, now there's a there's a weathered wooden fence post. I told you I'd show you one. That is a juvenile Cooper's hawk. It's by far and away the best picture I've ever gotten of a Cooper's hawk. Um, they, uh, uh, this juvenile was just sitting on this on this perch. I, I don't know why, but we were just driving along in Point Reyes and saw a bird on a, a raptor on a fence post, and it turned out to be a juvenile Cooper's hawk. Um, the uh, these are occipiters; they're not budios. And as you know, occipiters are ambush predators. They hide in the trees, watching for birds to fly by, and then they dart out of the trees and grab the birds. So it's hard to see Cooper's hawks in the open because they don't stay in the open; they hide so that they can ambush birds as they fly by. Um, there are a number of great horn places where great horned owls nest in Point Reyes. Um, so you have a really good chance of seeing them um, if if you know um, where where to look. Um, the uh, uh, this is a juvenile uh, great horned owl who has come out at dusk, um, been hiding in the trees, but now is coming out so he can scream at his parents to bring him food. <clears throat> These really are apex predators. They have a a uh, very large uh, array of foods that they eat. They can catch things and eat things up to the size of a rabbit. Um, there's a place in Point Reyes where there were some great owl, great horn, horned owls roosting. And when you looked under their roost site, there was a wing of a barn owl. So they even eat barn owls. Um, <clears throat> the, however, the juveniles have a, have a rough time. The juveniles don't do well. About 50% of the fledglings don't make it through their first year. Um, and the problem is they don't know how to hunt adequately, but once they learn how to hunt in their second year, then they do very well. And they just, they sort of rule, rule the skies because they'll just eat anything. And here's a couple more pictures of great horned owls at Point Reyes. I really like the picture on the left um, because this pair of owls that roosts at this location um, uh, often roosts in the cliff on, on a cliff side. And it's amazing how well camouflaged the owls are against these rocks. You think of them being camouflaged against the tree trunks and stuff, but look at look at how well it's how hard it is to see in the rocks. Um, I don't know how well you people know Point Reyes, but you can often see owls at the trailhead to the Keyhoe Beach Trail. So. <clears throat> and here's a, a killdeer that we that I saw at Point Reyes. Um, they're large plovers. Um, 
their name for their name because their call is supposed to sound like they're saying kill deer. Uh, they have a wide a, a wide range, um, um, and they're not uncommon. I just think that I really like them because they have that beautiful red eye ring. Unlike many plovers, these these aren't water so much water birds. You'll see them in the fields like this one is foraging. And here, here's an interesting uh, nor northern flicker. This is a this is a male northern flicker. Um, they're wood members of the woodpecker family. In fact, you can see the elongated shafts on his tail that they use to support themselves when they're hanging on trees. But the thing that's funny about them is that they mostly eat ants. So flickers actually spend most of their time on the ground foraging for ants, which really surprised me. Um, even though they're set up to be a woodpecker. Um, the western subspecies that, that are called red shafted, it used to be called red shafted flickers. And if you look at the tails, you can see that the main shaft and the feathers of the tail and also on the primary feathers you can't see, of the wings, you can't see it here, are red and they have a red mustache. And uh, on the east side of their range, there are yellow shafted flickers. The, sh the shafts are yellow and the mustache is black in the males. Females don't have the mustache, so they're easy to tell apart. The thing that was so funny about this is that this nest cavity was was less than six feet off the ground and had made in a fence post. It wasn't a living tree at all. And so, so I, I actually had to lower my tripod to get this eye level shot <laughs> of this bird. And this is a northern harrier that was um, uh, that, I, that was taken at Point Reyes. It's a male. People call males the gray ghost because they're gray and they fly pretty quietly. You'll notice that they that they, even though they're hawks relatives, the face looks more like an owl because they have a kind of a shield around their face, and that's because and they the shield serves the same function here as it does in owls. It funnels sound to their ears, so these birds much more than your average hawk uh, use hearing to find their prey, not their vision. And that's why you'll often see them skimming over the fields low down, listening, you know, with the head down, listening to see if they can hear something um, that they can catch and eat. Um, <clears throat> I really love the eyes on the males. I just think they're stunning. This is a snowy plover. Um, there's a breeding colony of snowy plover in Point Reyes. The area where they breed is fenced off during the breeding season, trying to keep people and dogs out because they're, it's easy to scare them away. And if you scare them off their nest, often they don't come back. <clears throat> Thus, our local snowy plovers aren't doing very well. Um, they have trouble with people, as I said, dogs, people, and also with predators from uh, ravens, uh, small falcons, other falcons. <clears throat> but a point raised, if they're left alone, it's okay. I don't know if you read the story, someone crashed a drone into the middle of a colony of snowy plovers and all the plovers left and none of them came back. So they're pretty, pretty, pretty wary about being disturbed while they're nesting. I think it has to do with they just nest in this little cup of sand um, with a few with a few rocks around it. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> excuse me. I apologize for showing a picture that's not a bird picture. Um, and I know that this is the Bay Area of bird photographers, um, but I really consider myself to be a wildlife photographer. I kind of like shooting almost any animal that I can see. Um, and surprisingly, um, I really have discovered that I like taking pictures of wild cats. I've been fortunate to be able to take pictures of five of the seven big cats that everyone thinks about when they think of wild cats. Um, but there are 30 species of small wild cats in the world, and I have seen three of them, I think. It's, it's amazing how, how hard they are to see. Um, but anyway, this is a bobcat at Point Reyes. Um, I just put it up so you could see there's lots of other stuff to see at Point Reyes. And I also just really love this picture. The bobcat's just caught a gopher and he's just get, look, looking right at me saying, this gopher is mine, you keep away. It's just, I just love the picture. We found a bluebird nest at Point Reyes, um, a Western bluebird nest. On the left is the female bringing food into the nest hollow. On the right is the male and then the male perched. You, gotta, you just gotta love those bluebirds. They're so pretty. Um, 
I do I do go to other places north of San Francisco besides Point Reyes, um, and they range in distance from San Francisco from Hawk Hill, which is in the Merritt Headlands just across uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, as far as far as Sebastopol. This is a picture of an acorn woodpecker actually taken in Sebastopol. Um, you'll notice he's got an insect in his beak, even though they're acorn wood woodpeckers and spend a lot of their time hunting and storing acorns when they have uh, nestlings, they eat a lot, they catch a lot of insects as a protein source, so the nestlings will grow. The males here have the red crown, you can barely see here, the females don't have it. This is a Bewix wren um, taken on Hawk Hill. I was just sitting up there walk, waiting for raptors to fly by, and this wren just popped up on this bush. Um, I had only seen them before in Canada and British Columbia and didn't even realize we had them here, but it turns out, of course, we do. Um, the birds vary in plumage across their range, being browner north and grayer south, and also browner um, when they're it's more humid where they're living. And this bird doesn't seem like it can make up its mind because it's gray on the bottom and brown on the top, but I think that's because San Francisco is sort of right on the border of where they turn brown and gray. Here's another picture of a northern flicker. Um, I just liked it because of the nice light and the rock perch. And here are uh, a pair of, ra of ravens at uh, sunrise, again up on Hawk, on, uh, up on Hawk Hill. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in Palo Alto in the uh, 1960s, and I just don't remember hearing or seeing crows or ravens at all. They just I feel like they just weren't here. Um, and I think now we have them all over the place, and I just think it's because there's so many people and so much garbage. But uh, but they're here. There's nothing we can do about it. I'm not really very sure what these birds were doing because um, I didn't see any food being transferred here, but maybe there was some food being transferred and it was courting. They are kind of beautiful if you can catch the iridescence um, uh, like this. And the ravens have this those interesting feathers that kind of come down along their their beak. I really like peregrine falcons, and uh, there are I know of uh, three peregrine falcon nests that I can drive to from San Francisco. Um, the the falcon you know, people talk about birds mating for life, and there are birds that mate for life. That is, they spend the entire year together. But falcons aren't like that. The falcons have loyalty to a nest site. And the pair, after the pair has fledged their chicks and the chicks are independent, they leave and go their separate ways. And then at the next breeding se season, they come back to the nest site and meet up again. So it's more nest site loyalty than, than uh, breeding, than, than, than pairing for life. Um, <clears throat> As you, this picture I like because the male's in the front and the female's in the back, and you can see how much bigger the female is than the male. Males ma males are, are actually called tercels, um, which comes from the Latin word for a third, because the males are about a third smaller than the females. And here are a couple more peregrine falcon pictures taken north. On the left is a juvenile. You can see he's, he's got, uh, you know, speckled feathers, feathering all over his uh, chest and abdomen and uh, his leggings. And uh, you can see on the right, an adult, they're all white there. Their heads are darker too. It's easy to tell them apart. This was the juvenile there is holding onto the rock and practicing exercising its wings. And this is a surf scoter. I just I just put this one in because I think the male's beak is so beautiful. Um, this picture was taken at uh, Rodeo Beach in the Marin Headlands. Um, females are brown and don't have the party colored beak. This is a horned lark. They're supposed to be common around here. It's the first time I'd ever seen one. Um, they apparently stay in fields with low grass. Um, but they are their population is falling uh, fifty percent in the last sixty years, and no one really knows why. But most people point their fingers at habitat loss. I also go east of San Francisco. I go to the East Bay and even into the Central Valley. Um, here's a picture of a brown pelican that was taken in Richmond. Um, 
brown pelicans are really beautiful when they're in breeding plumage as this bird is. When they're non-breeding, they're just gray. Brown pelicans are unusual as pelicans because they uh, hunt for fish by diving. So they fly over the water. When they see a fish, they dive in and catch it in the, just kind of scoop it up with their beak. Most pelicans uh, fish by swimming on the water and just scooping the water up with their beak as they move along, hoping to scoop up something. More burrowing owls uh, in Richmond. Again, these are migratory. These are migratory burrowing owls, but they're right along. They're right. They live right along the bay uh, in Rich in Richmond. These are uh, sandhill cranes. Um, I'm sure most of you know that sandhill cranes come down to overwinter in the Central Valley. Um, I think that it's a really great place to go and photograph sandhill cranes because often you're the only fo photographer there uh, if you get up early in the morning for the sunrise. Um, and I've seen pictures of people where, where you're supposed to go, you know, the famous place, Bosto Apache, where there are a hundred people lining the road. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of the crowds. The, this picture was taken at a farm called Staten Island Farm, which is run by the Nature Conservancy. Um, and they set it up to show farmers that you could still farm sustainably in a wildlife friendly way and reduce admissions and make a profit farming. Um, and it's a great place to go to get pictures of the uh, sandhill cranes. Thunder swans also uh, overwinter in the Central Valley. Um, and uh, some years there have been just thousands of them at Staten Island Farm. They're just really big and surprisingly not really big for a swan, but they're just really big. You know, they can weigh up to 17 pounds and their wingspan is uh, more than five feet. Um, the subspecies that we have uh, here overwinters on both coasts of the United States and breeds uh, way in the far north of Canada. There's a similar swan that's a little bigger called a uh, trumpeter swan, but it doesn't have that little yellow dot that you can see in front of the eye that you can see on these birds. These birds were initially described by Meriwether Lewis and, of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and he called them whistling swans because of the sounds that their wings made when they flew. <laughs> this, this is one of my favorite photos, and I don't think anybody else really likes it, but I do. Um, because I think it just it just cracks me up. I am not a shorebird guy. I think there are all these shorebirds out there, and they all look the same. They all have these, you know, this mottled plumage. They vary in size a little bit, but it's hard to remember who's bigger than who. Um, but in this case, you don't even have to see the bird's head, and you know what kind of bird it is. It's a long-billed curlew, because long-billed curlews have one of the longest bills of all birds, and, and there it is. You can see it. Um, they just overwinter here, so you have to look for them in the, in the winter. Um, and as you can see, they have this beautiful uh, cinnamon color to their underwings that I think is just really, really nice. The females actually have a longer beak than the males, and this is a female that beaks curved a little bit more, um, and it's a little bit longer. And this is a marbled godwit, another one of the overwintering shorebirds. Um, they're pretty easy to identify because they have a pink bill with a black tip. Um, they also have, however, are modeled with cinnamon underwings, so you have to think that that looks like a really long bill, but it's not nearly as long as a, uh, as a long billed curlew's bill. Um, these, these pictures have all been taken at, uh, in Richmond, this one too. Here's showing that nice cinnamon underwing. The trouble with this bird is you can't tell it has a pink bill with a black tip because its bill is completely covered with mud, which I thought was pretty funny. This is a wimbrel. Um, I was sort of surprised to be watching this wimbrel and see it pull a muscle up out of the mud. And then it spent, I don't know, 10 minutes maybe just playing around with the muscle, trying to figure out how to manipulate it in its beak so it could swallow it. And I was thinking, that's crazy. You know, you're going to swallow the muscle. How you, you know, what's going to happen? But it swallowed it. So I assume they have a way of dissolving the shell and, uh, and, and absorbing the nutrients that uh, uh, inside the shell. Um, but it was pretty fun to watch him just play around with this thing, trying to get it 
to be swallowed. Um, there are two subspecies. There's the one that we have, and then there's one um, in Europe and Asia. And people argue about whether they're one species or two species. And the willet is another shorebird that overwinters here. They're reasonably easy to identify because of that heavy white stripe on their underwing. Um, I just like this picture because I'm, I like the way he's dragging his toes, trying to, trying to, I guess, trying to slow down um, uh, to, uh, to be able to perch on the mud flat and search for food. They are a mem member and the largest member of the sandpiper family. And this is an American avocet, a bird that I a bird I really like. Um, this one is in non-breeding plumage. When they're in breeding plumage, they're uh, the the dark gray area on the bird turns kind of this beautiful rusty red, uh, reddish color uh, in both the males and the females. They they do have a decurved bill. I mentioned in my write up here that that means that it's con uh, cave up because I had no idea what decurved meant when someone told me somebody had a decurved bill. It just looked curved to me, but anyway, just tells you which way the curve goes. I have seen them in breeding plumage here with regularity. I think they're breeding here, but they're not supposed to breed here because um, their breeding grounds are in the center of the of North America. I also travel south of San Francisco. Um, as I'm sure you know, the shore of the bay in Palo Alto and Sunnyvale is covered by a series of parks. They have walking trails. You can walk right along the estuaries there. Um, I also go to Pacifica because there are peregrine falcons there, um, but also farther south, Coyote Hills, other parts of the Don Nelson Reserve, Half Moon Bay, Calero Reservoir, um, which is in San Jose, and, in, and all the way to Santa Cruz. This is a juvenile peregrine falcon uh, in flight um, along the cliffs uh, in Pacifica. Um, these are, I find these birds difficult to get pictures of because they just fly so fast. You know, peregrine falcons have been timed stooping on prey uh, at speeds over 200 miles an hour. So if they're flying, you know, sort of slowly for a peregrine falcon, they're still going 60 miles an hour as they fly by the cliffs. And when you're shooting with a long lens, you know, your field of view is so small, it's hard to find the bird, how to, hard to keep the bird in the frame when they're flying so fast. They're, they're just missiles, but you sometimes you can get a picture of them. It's worth going, uh, to, going to get a picture. Here's a series of pictures showing the peregrines mating. Um, the, you, again, you can see the males coming in on the top, the females at the bottom. You can see how much bigger the female is. She she kind of started calling as she was flying and landed here, and you can see her beak still open. She's just calling and calling and calling. The male flies in. They uh, copulate. The male's done, and he flies off. She flies off, but you can see she's still calling. She's still calling as he flies away, and then she took off. And I just love this picture because of the shadow that she cast on the on the cliff uh, rocks of the cliff as she took off. And here's a couple more action shots. Uh, peregrine falcons don't like ravens, and they don't like them near their nestlings. And so here's the peregrine coming in has actually grabbed this raven by its talons and is swinging it around. And the picture on the right are two juveniles. The parents have brought in a blackbird and given it to one of the juveniles. And one of the other juveniles has flown in and is trying to steal it from his sibling, which I thought was pretty funny. While you're uh, watching the peregrines in their in their cliff nests, there are a lot of rocks around. So rock, there are rock wrens there. They'll perch right near you and sing their song. And sadly, they don't have a song that's as nice as the Pacific wrens, but they don't seem to mind. But they live in rocky environments all across the Western United States, into Canada, and also into Central America. There, <clears throat> there is a reservoir in uh, a Calero Reservoir, which is in Calero State Park. Uh, Calero Regional Park in uh, San Jose. If you haven't been, it's worth going because there are grebes in the reservoir, both uh, Clark's grebes and Western grebes. They look almost the same, and the only real difference between them is um, the black on the top of the head in the uh, Clark's grebe doesn't come down below the eye, and in the Western grebe, it does go below the eye. Um, and that's how and that's how you tell them apart. Um, I see lo lots more Western Greaves than Clark's Greaves when I'm there, but they're both there. And you know, Greaves do that funny uh, uh, dance where they 
bob their heads at each other and then rotate 90 degrees and just run next to each other, just run across the water. And that's what this picture is showing. The picture of the grebe, you can see it's a Western grebe, how the black comes below the eye. Um, the uh, This grebe had caught a fish and some of his friends were chasing him, trying to steal the fish. So he's just on the run to get away. And here's another grebe, again, uh, Western grebe, who has a fish he's trying to use it as a, um, to try to, to get a mate. And one of the things that's fun about grebes is the babies ride on the parent's back. So here's a Western grebe with her chick on her back. This is an Allen's hummingbird. Um, it's the, it's sort of the other hummingbird that you're likely to see in the city of San Francisco, but they breed here. They don't overwinter here, so you only see them in the summer. <clears throat> They're really easy to tell apart from the Anna's hummingbirds because they have this orangey gold gorget with a iridescent green cap, so they don't have any of that pinkish red or purple. They are, however, very similar in appearance to rufous hummingbirds, which migrate through the Bay Area in the spring and the fall, but don't stay here. Um, the differences have to do with their tail feathers, and I'm just not going to talk about that. Um, but rufous hummingbirds are mostly rufous, so their bodies are mostly brown. And, and, and Allen's hummingbirds, the backs are mostly green. Um, but of course, there's little overlap, so sometimes it's hard to take them apart. Um, this was taken at the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum, although I've certainly seen those these birds in San Francisco regularly. And there's another picture of uh, Alan's hummingbird just showing off their beautiful iridescent cap and gorget. Um, I'm, a good place to take pictures of uh, osprey is in Richmond on the on the bay on the coast of the bay in Richmond. Um, although I have to say this picture was actually taken in San, south of Santa Cruz. Um, this was a male bird who was flying back and forth uh, trying to bring nesting material to. Uh, the nest uh, where his mate was sitting uh, on the nest um, and he would land on a pole and look around and then take off. Interestingly, while we were watching these osprey, we noticed that there was a, a single double crested cormorant who was fishing and uh, popped up pretty close to us with this pretty good sized catfish. Um, and we got to watch him try to manipulate the catfish. So you know, birds like this have to follow, swallow the fish head first so the fins fold back and don't, the fish doesn't get stuck in their throat. And remarkably, this bird was able to swallow this catfish. Um, but I like the picture because the catfish colors highlight the uh, cormorant's colors. And you can see the, the, they have a blue mouth. The inside of their mouth is blue. Um, this is a black oyster catcher, which is our lo local oyster catcher. Blackbird with white legs and a red beak and a kind of unusual eye. Um, they're found um, from the, the Aleutian Islands in Alaska all the way down the coast uh, to uh, Baja, California. But they change a little bit. As you go south, the birds in the north are all black. And as you move south, they start turning a little bit browner. And as you get way south, they start having some little flecks of white feathers. And people think that that's because they hybridize with um, American oyster catchers, which, as you know, are brown and white, not black. Um, and they overlap in the southern part of the black oyster, oyster catchers range. Interestingly, we call them oyster catchers, but mostly they eat limpets and barnacles. They don't really eat oysters. I imagine there are a number of people sitting in the audience who got a picture of this long-eared owl. Um, I, it was at uh, Coyote Hills Regional Park. I think I must have been the last person in the Bay Area to hear about this owl. Um, but I did go down there to try to get pictures of it. And it was an interesting experience. The first day I went, um, there were about 25 people standing where I had been told to stand to watch for the owl. And the we didn't see the owl. And that was on a Saturday. And then on Sunday, I came back and it's sort of a pain because you have to be there before the sun rises. And I'm driving from San Francisco to Coyote Hills, you know, south of San Jose uh, in the East Bay. Um, and, uh, and we did see it the second day. There were about 12 photographers the second day. And uh, we did see it fly by, its silhouette fly by in the dark 
just as the sun was rising and that's all we saw but i went back again the next day and that was on monday and then there were about five of us there and uh the owl uh, perched right on this big log and just sat there intermittently as it flew around flying with just enough light that I could get a picture. Although you'll notice, I'm telling you, I took this at a 1 25th of a second. That's one of the things that's good about perched owls. They hold still. And I, my understanding is the owl left a few days later, so I was lucky that I got to see it. Here's some more Northern Harriers um, that were taken at the Palo Alto Balins Park, the male again, the gray ghost with those beautiful eyes, uh, who's gray and the female kind of brown, mottled brown. They don't look the same. Juvenile males look like females. So you see lots more mottled brown birds than you see gray birds. And this is a white-tailed kite. They're, they are found uh, from Oregon all the way into Baja, California, then through Central America with a large range in South America. Um, but there is a pair that nests um, at Shoreline Park in Sunnyvale, so you can see them there. Um, there are two other species of kites, and if I showed you the picture, you'd look at me and say, what's the difference? There's a black wing kite that lives in Europe, Africa, and Asia, and a black shouldered kite in Australia, and they just look the same. Um, kites hunt by what's called kiting. They just hover. Um, facing into the wind and you, you can just look up and there's a bird flapping it's in just flapping its wings in one place hovering and you'll know it's a kite um, very few other raptors can do that there are some but very few um, and they watch the ground and then will dive down and catch their prey and then i said uh i said that i was going to show you some parrot pictures and i wasn't lying uh, this is a red man, red mass par parakeet. Um, these, this is one of the feral parakeets that lives in San Francisco. They're famous because there was a book written about them called The Par Parrots of Telegraph Hill, and the book was made into a movie. So you can see a movie about them if you want. Um, there's a lot of controversy about where they came from, but they're well established in the city, and they're actually moving down the peninsula a little bit. Um, one of the big problems for them is that, unfortunately, there are also mitered parakeets um, uh, in this that that are feral here. And the genus that these birds are in, Sitacara, um, consists of birds that range from all green to birds that have lots of red on their heads. So you can have all green, a little bit of red, a little more red, a little more red, lots of red, and then a lot of red. Um, in the species and they interbreed. And I think it's just unfortunate when you dilute the gene pool of these species by having interbreeding. Um, people have, whoops, people have, people have studied, whoops, people have studied the birds and tried to, uh, you know, see if they're causing any problems um, for native birds in the area. And really the only thing that people have been able to to turn, that anyone's been able to determine is they're really noisy and local residents don't like them so much, but the tourists really like them. They are having some problems now because there's a second generation rat poison that people are putting out on the roofs of the apartments. And, you know, it's grain that's been poisoned. And if these birds eat it, they get a neurologic disease and will die. Um, then I had, as you saw, I have one more picture of one. Um, they were eating these, the, uh, flowers flowers of this tree at, at uh, Fort Mason both these both, both those pictures were taken at Fort Mason so there you have it a sort of a tour of the Bay Area during the COVID years and what I was able to accomplish um, even though it was hard it was more difficult to get out and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have yeah let me stop my share there you go thank you Oh, that was fantastic. So, you know, uh, like in the past, you know, so please feel free to, um, I don't know, raise a hand or just call Corey and let me know if you have any questions or you can use the chat box. And while people are doing that, um, I just had a quick comment, uh, Corey, and maybe um, I just got lucky, but I've actually seen Avocet's breed here. In fact, um, you know, breed and mate and, and raise chicks. So 
this this definitely happens in the in San Mateo, uh, Palo Alto area. So yeah, I, I I think that the birds that are farther south down the peninsula are mitered parrots. Um, the difference you have to look under their wing to see the difference. The mitered parakeet, the parakeets are a little bigger, um, and they have a little more red on their head. But I'm not positive about that. They could be mixing down there too. Oh. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, I was talking about the avocet. The, oh, the, the avocet. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said yeah, parrots. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, sure. no. yeah no, no, they no. do. I think they do breed. I see them in breeding plumage, but I never found a nest. It sounds like you're doing better than I. Uh, so, son, actually, because of COVID, yeah. um, we, we were all allowed only to drive up to a certain point, right? So within five miles, I found a, a really nice area. And the first thing I noticed is like a pair of avocets just dancing and walking around. And so I, I went there for almost, I would say, two and a half, three months. And I saw them mating. I saw them with the eggs. And then I saw them with a the chick. So as it was you very, very I good. To, I have to say, as you mentioned yeah. it now, I think I've actually seen some chicks too. Because, you know, the chicks the chicks come yeah. off the nest very early. And then you can see the parents yeah. walking around with extra sets of legs under them. And I think that I've yeah. seen <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. I've seen that a couple of times now that you mention it. Yeah, yeah mud flats. Yep. Mud flats, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. So, questions, questions, comments. Surprising. Usually, I I hope people are still able to hear me and you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I. Maybe I. Thank you. No, it's my pleasure. Yeah. I hope I didn't run through too many birds, but I was just sort of trying to show what I've been doing the last couple of years. It's fascinating. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah. One thing I tell people, friends, family, everybody, that we live in a very, uh, you know, a, a very nice nature spot. You can bird all year long, pretty much. I uh, think rain or shine, and then you get different species. They are not as colorful as tropical birds that you can see in South America or maybe Asia, but you get to see a lot of variety. Yep. It's absolutely fascinating. Yep. Yeah, Diane says thank you for the beautiful photos of the usual suspects. You know, I think it's I saw I, th I think it's funny. It sort of is the when people tell me what I've been doing, I tell them I've been taking what I think are reasonably good pictures of really common birds. Um, yeah. I, but I do love some of them. I'll tell you, the peregrines are common these days, but I just love taking pictures of them. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's where I met you as well in the in yeah, Pacific. No, we were there. That's right. Shooting the bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the long-eared owl too. My God, it it did uh, give us a really good show last year. Yep. No, I was just so I felt so lucky to see it because, as I said, I was way at the tail end, um, and I don't think people saw it more than a week after the I took that picture. Um, I know some of my friends are down there already looking around, and they're seeing barn owls and short-eared owls, but they haven't seen a long-eared owl. Yeah. Yeah, the last time it was reported was almost uh, six years ago. Yeah, is that right? So just luck. Yep. Yeah. I had a question about the burrowing owls. Yeah. You had mentioned the uh, the resident population. Yes. I read that that's generally like in the South Bay or further south from there. So the the burrowing owl, the resident population of burrowing owls is in trouble here because of feral cats. Um, and there was a pop, there were pairs that were breeding in Palo Alto Baylands, um, and in Shoreline Park. Um, but <laughs> sort of sadly, there was, there was this, I don't know what to call it, this group of people at Google called the cat lover, Google cat lovers, and they were putting food out for the cats or the feral cats. And uh, and they just decimated the burrowing owls, um, oh, no. and they actually you know they actually put cameras out and showed it, and you know the cat people are saying, oh no, we're feeding them so they won't catch any birds, and of course they were, and oh we spay them so that they won't make more cat, but they're still I mean a cat is a uh, a house cat is a cat, they're evolutionarily designed to be very efficient hunters, and they are. So it was, it's sort of, it was sort of sad, but, uh, but by the, you know, but you couldn't, I mean, it's, things like that happen all the time. 
I want to emphasize I don't have anything against cats if you keep your cat in the inside all the time. But cats don't yeah. belong outside. And these cats, they're, they were feeding cats, so there was a large population of feral cats in the area and just wiped out the burrowing owls. Um, the populations, the, the migratory population, the feral populations actually separate themselves, one being up in the hills and one being in the lowlands um, in the winter. So you can see them in both places. Um, but yeah, there still are some burrowing owls way in the South Bay, but I don't get down there very, very, very often. So are the ones in the lowlands the uh, migratory ones? I knew you were going to ask me that. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I just can't remember. Do you remember, Kat? No, nope, my wife doesn't remember either. I think that the lowland ones were the migratory ones. Okay, because I thought the one that appeared in the Berkeley Richmond area was the one that just like was over a, a winter one and not a regular. Well, the ones, it's certainly true that the one the, the ones in Richmond and Berkeley and Richmond are migratory. So that's lowland, that's for sure. I mean, they're right on the shore of the bay. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. No problem. Great. Uh, Corey, one last question then. I know this year, last year has been difficult and you've been photographing locally, but now it's open. The world has opened up. Talked about Australia. Huh. Any other plans? So we have made a few um, trips. Um, we We've been to we've been to Tanzania and Botswana, and we're going to Kenya in February. Um, yeah, and we've we've made some, a few other trips. It, it's I don't know. Um, we've been up. To, we've been up. We I I don't know if you noticed. I had some great gray owl pictures and some common loon pictures that were from British yeah, Columbia. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we made a trip up there, and that was. I saw lazuli bunting for the first time on that trip, which was pretty fun. Um, but seeing the great gray owls was really kind of a thrill. And we saw, six, you know, six, trying to think it was three or two mating pairs and each one of them had a couple of fledglings. So it was really oh, something. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that was really fun. And, um, and I did, we did go to Australia um for three weeks and it really was a spectacular trip i'm still kind of running through my pictures but mm -hmm. as i as i mentioned 19 parrot species and in, in a three-week period of time was pretty exciting pretty exciting yeah looking forward to it then yeah like, yeah a any of these any of these pictures in the audubon photo um, competition or none of so, them so i don't I, I meant to go back and look so i only I usually only enter two photo contests a year. I en enter the National Audubon Society photo contest. And then I don't know how many people here are members of the North American Nature Photographers Association, NAMPA. NAMPA, yeah. Yeah, but if you're not, they sell camera insurance and it's very reasonably priced. So it's worth joining. And they have uh, they have a, comp a competition uh, that they call the showcase competition. Um, and... Uh, that, that I also have had some picture, pic, pictures well received there. But in Audubon, the, be, the best that I've done is top 100. Um, but I still think that's pretty good. <laughs> so um, it's, it's um, fascinating. Yeah. yeah. But those, yeah. I, it's more for support for those organizations, although I do like sending my pictures mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the, one of the things about all these pictures that you have is what do you do with them? You know, they're sitting yeah. on my computer. So all of my parrot pictures I have donated, just given to various parrot conservation NGOs, and they've been used in their their quarterly magazines, their monthly uh, email newsletters, their ca their calendars that they sell, uh, you know, all all of that stuff, which I think is great because then they're doing something useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, any other comments, questions? We have an exciting uh, presentation also lined up for next next month, January onwards. Um, and then I will send out an email about uh, what I'm planning for April because I was trying to change a little bit of the schedule around. We have speakers for January, February, 
March and May. And for April, I was really thinking, getting an opinion uh, via email about if people are interested to do a uh, bring your own photos thing or maybe even do a photo shoot and share some of the photos from the photo shoot. So just to get the group out a little more, a little more into the field and see. So uh, please look out for an email from me. And, and if you have time and if you have any ideas, uh, let me know. Happy to uh, you know take some recommendations there. So yeah, and uh, this recording will be on our website. I think I'll just process it tonight. It takes a couple of you know couple of days to host it there, uh, but it should soon be online. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks right. everyone for listening. Well, thank oh, you thank you very much. much for presentation. Yeah. And, and Sri, thanks for inviting me. I'll be I'll be in touch with you. Ah, All right. absolutely. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.